Good morning. Good morning. Good to see all of you in the Lord's house this morning. We begin uh, with our first hymn, number 750.
preach to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you, his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the doubts praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. The Old Testament reading for the fifth Sunday after Pentecost is from Lamentations chapter 3, and this is also today's sermon text. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes, and let him be filled with insults. For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own free will, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God, to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that, as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need, so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Stand gospel reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the fifth chapter. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, 
My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for twelve years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter's dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was about 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens.
heads up that we do have a children's message this morning. And actually, there could be an adult component to this as well. So if you don't mind, adults, open the front of your hymnal to Psalm 119. I know you just put your hymnals away. We're going to do a little Hebrew alphabet lesson this morning. So any children can come up that would like to come up. like everybody that's coming probably knows their ABCs, like we don't have anybody really little. We can, and we know your ABCs, right? She smiled at me like, oh, uh -huh. she knows her ABCs. Okay. So here's uh, the Hebrew version of the ABCs. And we're going to practice those and then read a book about Jeremiah. Because Jeremiah was a really good writer, and he had to learn his Hebrew alphabet first. Um, so in, in Hebrew, you know, well, in English, which way do you read? Where do you start if you're going to read something in English? Which corner do you start in? By point? Show me, the, show me the corner you start with. Okay, but Hebrew, you start over here, and you go that way. So it's backwards for us, right? So we're going to practice the letters, and the adults can say them with us, because if you've got Psalm 119, they're, they're all there. So uh, just repeat after me. Here we go. Hebrew alphabet lesson. Aleph. Aleph. Beth. Gimel. Daleth. Hey, wow, wow. Zion. Zion. That's what they said when they crossed the Jordan River. They said, hey, wow, Zion. <laughs> anyway, hey, hey. hey. you got to clear your throat a little bit with that one. Hey, kind of a German sound. Okay, and tape, hey. yod, yod. Uh, what is that? Um, I forgot, cough, right? Cough, a bunch of coughing sort of. Lamed, mame. Noon, Noon. Sonic, Ayin, Ayin, Pei, Sada, Kof, which is different from Kof, uh, Reish, and then there's one letter that has two sounds, it's Sin and Shin. Sin, sin and shin. shin. It depends which side the dot is on. Well, there's one way the dot's on one side, and it's a different way the other way. Tau is the last one. Alright, so that's the Hebrew alphabet. And it's important because in the Book of Lamentations, which Jeremiah wrote, he did an acrostic, just like the writer of Psalm 119 did. And he made in, verse, in chapters 1, 2, and 4, he started each verse with a different letter. So the first verse he started with Aleph, the next verse with Beth, and so on. In chapter 3, he did three in a row, three Alephs, three Beths, three Gimbals, three Dalas. So he's really kind of a talented writer that he can do that. Anyway, I wanted you to know about the Hebrew alphabet, but really, more important is the story of Jeremiah. Jeremiah and the fall of Jerusalem. When Jeremiah was a boy, God's voice one day he heard, I've chosen you to speak for me, to go and preach my word. But Jeremiah was unsure. I'm just a lad, said he. You're not too young to make a start, God answered, trust in me. The years went by, young Jeremiah studied long and hard, all through Jerusalem, folks knew the, this prophet for the Lord. He spoke to everyone he'd meet. Some heard, some turned away. And he'd teach them little stories, like the one about some clay. Just watch a potter at his wheel and see what he can do. When things go wrong, he starts again and shapes the clay anew. That's just how God can work with us, a potter shaping clay shaping us to serve him well and follow in his way. But if our people do not try to live as God would wish, our country will be broken up, just like a broken dish. Now, when the king heard words like these, his temper reached a peak. Jeremiah's making trouble. I will not let him speak. Now look, he's writing Hebrew. You can't quite tell this Hebrew there, can you? Jeremiah wasn't pleased. His brow took on a frown. I think the time has come, said he. I'll write my words all down. But when the king had heard the book, he cut it full of gashes. He threw the pieces in the fire and watched them burn to ashes. Is that a very good way to treat God's word? No. The prophet felt so very sad, but God said, don't despair, rewrite it now, and add much more, and warn this land, beware. The people in Jerusalem said, 
we will never fall. They planned for war with Babylon, the strongest land of all. Said Jeremiah, do not fight. He spread God's warnings far. Jerusalem is lost, he cried, while Judah planned for war. For the people said, we'd rather fight. We surely cannot fail. And Jeremiah's enemies locked him up in jail. We put him in a prison cell, but that's too good, they cried. He has fresh air and sunshine in the prison yard outside. Let's throw him in a muddy hole deep in the ground instead. The king agreed. He did not care. Do what you wish, he said. God heard Jeremiah pray within the gloomy pit and sent the king's own servant, Eben, who pulled him out of it. Jeremiah still would preach within the prison walls, but no one ever listened, so he watched the city fall. And you can kind of see like the fire from the burning city over there. That's what that's supposed to show. When all was lost, destroyed, wiped out, the people scattered wide, Jeremiah hoped to live along the countryside, but others forced him down to Egypt, where the prophet knew that he would still proclaim God's word and serve his whole life through. And there you go. Thanks for listening. Go home and practice your Hebrew alphabet. <laughs>
uh, Lamentations is dated more specifically right around the year 587 BC, exactly when the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and forced the largest group of exiles uh, into captivity. Each of this book's five chapters could be its own separate little unit, its own separate lament, yet the five fit together into one larger lament as well. If you read it, and I hope you will, it's not that long, you can't help but feel the pain and share the sorrow and know the regret that the prophet and his people shared. In fact, I think it's amazing that Jeremiah had the strength to write anything at all as the disaster struck his city, his nation, and his people. Those were dark days with no light at all. The Lord had become like an enemy. Not even the neighbor nations could believe it. Jerusalem had fallen. Three chapters out of five start with the same word, how. And that word can work like a question or an exclamation. How suddenly, how drastically things have changed. How has the Lord allowed this to happen? Well, Jeremiah could have said to his people, you can't say I didn't warn you. He admits that the cause of the disaster was the people's stubborn refusal to, re to turn from their sinful ways and back to the Lord. But he also suffers with them. He doesn't simply say, I told you so. He does say, our fathers sinned and are no more, and we bear their iniquity. But he doesn't blame it all on the previous generations. He adds, woe to us, for we have sinned. And what do sinners deserve? Well, as we regularly and rightly confess, we justly deserve the Lord's present and eternal punishment. We say it, but do we mean it? We often act as if we deserve better. We are often surprised by the sufferings that come to us as citizens of this sinful world, and especially as those who would faithfully follow our Lord, each carrying the cross that he assigns. When the way through this world is dark, when God's face is hidden from our sight, it is all too easy for us to imagine that we have been cut off from our God. So, like Jeremiah, we may find ourselves saying things like, I have forgotten what happiness is. My endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. But then, somehow, we remember. Somehow, the Spirit of the Lord reminds us of who He is and what He has promised His people. Just as the sun continues shining all night long, even though we cannot see it, so the Lord's character remains unchanged through the ups and downs of our circumstances. He is always the same. Merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Remember that. When people ask, how are you? The polite answer is, I'm fine, but that's not always the honest answer. The fact is that if we're completely honest, sometimes we aren't so fine. Life in this world has more than enough dark and difficult days, but we need not unload all our troubles on each person who asks us about our welfare. I learned an alternative answer from my brother-in-law, my younger sister's husband, who's also a pastor. I don't often use his answer myself, but I like it for the truth it expresses without unloading too much on an unsuspecting person. So when asked, how are you, my brother-in-law answers with today's sermon title. He's been known to say, better than I deserve. And that could be a true statement, no matter how well things are going. And it could also open doors for conversations about the serious consequences of our sin and the reality of God's mercy and grace. But in God's system of justice, if I'm doing better than I deserve, 
then someone else had to suffer in my place. Since God in his justice does not, in fact cannot, let sin go unpunished. In our text, which is the brightest portion of a rather dark book, Jeremiah mentions things like bearing a yoke, suffering in silence, being struck on the cheek, and enduring under insults. All of these describe the experience of our Lord Jesus as he carried our sin on his shoulders, suffering in silence as he was struck and insulted, despite his complete innocence. He got far worse than he deserved in his passion and crucifixion so that the sinners of the world may get better than we deserve, even now, but especially in eternity. Yes, there are times when the Lord allows us to grieve over our sins and their consequences, but that's not his favorite way to deal with us. He prefers to show us his compassion, his steadfast love, his mercy faithfully every morning. His salvation may seem slow in coming, but it is coming. It will come, just as he promised. Wait for it in hope. Endure suffering in silence, or cry out to God for help as needed. Know that we who trust in the Lord always get better than we deserve, because our Lord Jesus suffered incomparably in our place and died the death we deserved. The Lord will not cast us off forever. His mercies will never come to an end. He is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. Amen. We stand and sing his praises.
by the healing medicine of the word and sacraments, pour into our hearts such love toward you that we may live eternally. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Merciful Lord, for the benefit of your people, you call faithful men and women to serve in a variety of offices in your church. Grant that your Holy Spirit may lead and guide us to find and call a principle to serve among us according to your gracious will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Faithful God, whose mercies are new every morning, we humbly pray that you would look upon us in mercy and renew us by your Holy Spirit. Keep safe our goings out and our, our going out and our coming in, and let your blessing remain with us throughout this day. Preserve us in your righteousness and grant us a portion in, the, in that eternal life which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty, everlasting God, your Son has assured forgiveness of sins and deliverance from eternal death. Strengthen us by your Holy Spirit that our faith in Christ may increase daily and that we may hold fast to the hope that on the last day we shall be raised in glory to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Most gracious God and Father, we thank and praise you for sending rain to water the earth causing it to be fruitful and to bring forth food in plenteous supply. Teach us ever to remember that we do not live on bread alone, in order that we may receive your blessings with thanksgiving and your word with grateful hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, our times are in your hands. Look with favor on those celebrating birthdays this week, Julia, Rodney, Bruton, Darlene, Allison, Anley, Peyton, Tyler, and Bernice. Grant that they may continue to grow in wisdom and grace. Strengthen their trust in your goodness and bless them with your abiding love all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
all know that's one of my very favorites. Uh, so anyway, sing it at my funeral if you're still here. <laughs> uh, all right, um, so uh, seldom do I get in my car on a Sunday morning in the past decade, but this morning I'm covering Olive Branch while Pastor Drennan is gone, so our summer schedule allows me to do that, so I'm going to gather my things and head out this way. Sorry about that. If you have things you want to talk about, send me a text or call me or something later. Um, we will have Bible class, so it's group-led. Uh, anybody who can stay, please stay. We'll get, they'll gather up here. Um, uh, there's also a need to help move furniture at school. So if you're not seeing Bible class and you're able-bodied, you can move a few things, please stay and help with that for a little while if you can. Any other announcements this morning? Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.